This is section three of Mark Twain's Journal Writings, Volume One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Canvasser's Tale by Mark Twain, read by John Greenman. Poor sad-eyed stranger, there was that about his humble mien, his tired look, his decayed gentility, clothes that almost reached the mustard seed of charity that still remained, remote and lonely in the empty vastness of my heart notwithstanding i observed a portfolio under his arm and said to myself behold providence hath delivered his servant into the hands of another canvasser well these people always get one interested before i well knew how it came about this one was telling me his history and i was all attention and sympathy he told it something like this my parents died, alas, when I was a little sinless child. My uncle, Ithuriel, took me to his heart and reared me as his own. He was my only relative in the wide world, but he was good and rich and generous. He reared me in the lap of luxury. I knew no want that money could satisfy. In the fullness of time I was graduated and went with two of my servants my chamberlain and my valet to travel in foreign countries during four years i flitted upon careless wing amid the beauteous gardens of the distant strand if you will permit this form of speech in one whose tongue was ever attuned to poesy and indeed i so speak with confidence as one unto his kind for i perceive by your eyes that you too sir are gifted with the divine inflation in those far lands i reveled in the ambrosial food that fructifies the soul the mind the heart but of all things that which most appealed to my inborn aesthetic taste was the prevailing custom there among the rich of making collections of elegant and costly rarities dainty objets de vertu and in an evil hour i tried to uplift my uncle ethuriel to a plane of sympathy with this exquisite employment i wrote and told him of one gentleman's vast collection of shells another's noble collection of meerschaum pipes another's elevating and refining collection of undecipherable autographs another's priceless collection of old china another's enchanting collection of postage stamps and so forth and so on soon my letters yielded fruit my uncle began to look about for something to make a collection of you may know perhaps how fleetly a taste like this dilates his soon became a raging fever though i knew it not he began to neglect his great pork business presently he wholly retired and turned an elegant leisure into a rabid search for curious things his wealth was vast and he spared it not first he tried cow-bells he made a collection which filled five large salons and comprehended all the different sorts of cow-bells that ever had been contrived save one that one an antique and the only specimen extant was possessed by another collector my uncle offered enormous sums for it but the gentleman would not sell doubtless you know what necessarily resulted a true collector attaches no value to a collection that is not complete his great heart breaks he sells his hoard he turns his mind to some field that seems unoccupied thus did my uncle he next tried brickbats after piling up a vast and intensely interesting collection the former difficulty supervened his great heart broke again he sold out his soul's idol to the retired brewer who possessed the missing brick then he tried flint hatchets and other implements of primeval man but by and by discovered that the factory where they were made was supplying other collectors as well as himself he tried aztec inscriptions and stuffed whales another failure after incredible labor and expense when his collection seemed at last perfect 
a stuffed whale arrived from greenland and an aztec inscription from the cundurango regions of central america that made all former specimens insignificant my uncle hastened to secure these noble gems he got the stuffed whale but another collector got the inscription a real cundurango as possibly you know is a possession of such supreme value that when once a collector gets it he will rather part with his family than with it so my uncle sold out and saw his darlings go forth never more to return and his coal-black hair turned white as snow in a single night now he waited and thought he knew another disappointment might kill him he was resolved that he would choose things next time that no other man was collecting he carefully made up his mind and once more entered the field this time to make a collection of echoes of what said i echoes sir his first purchase was an echo in georgia that repeated four times his next was a six repeater in maryland his next was a thirteen repeater in maine his next was a nine repeater in kansas his next was a twelve repeater in tennessee which he got cheap so to speak because it was out of repair a portion of the crag which reflected it having tumbled down he believed he could repair it at a cost of a few thousand dollars and by increasing the elevation with masonry treble the repeating capacity but the architect who undertook the job had never built an echo before and so he utterly spoiled this one before he meddled with it it used to talk back like a mother-in-law and now it was only fit for the deaf and dumb asylum well next he bought a lot of cheap little double-barreled echoes scattered around over various states and territories he got them at twenty per cent off by taking the lot next he bought a perfect gatling gun of an echo in oregon and it cost a fortune i can tell you you may know sir that in the echo market the scale of prices is cumulative like the carat scale in diamonds in fact the same phraseology is used a single carat echo is worth but ten dollars over and above the value of the land it is on a two carat or double barreled echo is worth thirty dollars a five carat is worth nine hundred and fifty a ten carat is worth thirteen thousand my uncle's oregon echo which he called the great pit echo was a twenty-two carat gem and cost two hundred and sixteen thousand dollars they threw the land in for it was four hundred miles from a settlement well in the meantime my path was a path of roses i was the accepted suitor of the only and lovely daughter of an english earl and was beloved to distraction in that dear presence i swam in seas of bliss the family were content for it was known that i was sole heir to an uncle held to be worth five millions of dollars however none of us knew that my uncle had become a collector at least in anything more than a small way for aesthetic amusement now gathered the clouds above my unconscious head that divine echo since known throughout the world as the great kohinoor or mountain of repetitions was discovered you could utter a word and it would talk back at you for fifteen minutes when the day was otherwise quiet but behold another discovery was made at the same time another echo collector was in the field the two rushed to make the purchase the property consisted of a couple of small hills with a shallow swale between out yonder among the back settlements of new york state both men arrived on the ground at the same time and neither knew the other was there the echo was not all owned by one man a person by the name of williamson bolivar jarvis owned the east hill and a person by the name of harbison j bledsoe owned the west hill the swale between was the dividing line so 
while my uncle was buying Jarvis's hill for three million two hundred and eighty-five thousand dollars, the other party was buying Bledsoe's hill for a shade over three million. Now, do you perceive the natural result? Why, the noblest collection of echoes on earth was forever and ever incomplete, since it possessed but the one half of the king echo of the universe. Neither man was content with this divided ownership, yet neither would sell to the other. There were jawings, bickerings, heart-burnings, and at last that other collector, with a malignity which only a collector can ever feel toward a man and a brother, proceeded to cut down his hill. You see, as long as he could not have the echo he was resolved that nobody should have it. He would remove his hill and then there would be nothing to reflect my uncle's echo. My uncle remonstrated with him, but the man said, I own one end of this echo. I choose to kill my end. You must take care of your own end yourself. Well, my uncle got an injunction put on him. The other man appealed and fought it in a higher court. They carried it on up clear to the Supreme Court of the United States. It made no end of trouble there. Two of the judges believed that an echo was personal property, because it was impalpable to sight and touch, and yet was purchasable, saleable, and consequently taxable. Two others believed that an echo was real estate, because it was manifestly attached to the land, and was not removable from place to place. Other of the judges contended that an echo was not property at all. It was finally decided that the echo was property, that the hills were property, that the two men were separate and independent owners of the two hills, but tenants in common in the echo. Therefore defendant was at full liberty to cut down his hill, since it belonged solely to him, but must give bonds in three million dollars as indemnity for damages which might result to my uncle's half of the echo. This decision also debarred my uncle from using his defendant's hill to reflect his part of the echo without defendant's consent. He must use only his own hill. If his part of the echo would not go, under these circumstances it was sad, of course, but the court could find no remedy. The court also debarred defendant from using my uncle's hill to reflect his end of the echo without consent. You see the grand result. Neither man would give consent, and so that astonishing and most noble echo had to cease from its great powers, and since that day that magnificent property is tied up and unsaleable. A week before my wedding day, while I was still swimming in bliss, and the nobility were gathering from far and near to honor our espousals, came news of my uncle's death, and also a copy of his will, making me his sole heir. He was gone. Alas, my dear benefactor was no more. The thought surcharges my heart even at this remote day. I handed the will to the earl. I could not read it for the blinding tears. The earl read it, then he sternly said, Sir, do you call this wealth? But doubtless you do in your inflated country. Sir, you are left sole heir to a vast collection of echoes, if a thing can be called a collection that is scattered far and wide over the huge length and breadth of the American continent. Sir, that is not all. You are head and ears in debt. There is not an echo in the lot, but has a mortgage on it. Sir, I am not a hard man, but I must look to my child's interest. If you had but one echo which you could honestly call your own, if you had but one echo which was free from encumbrance, so that you could retire to it with my child, and by humble painstaking industry cultivate and improve it, and thus wrest from it a maintenance, I would not say you nay but I cannot marry my child to a beggar. Leave his side, my darling. Go, sir. Take your mortgage-ridden echoes, and quit my sight forever. 
my noble celestine clung to me in tears with loving arms and swore she would willingly nay gladly marry me though i had not an echo in the world but it could not be we were torn asunder she to pine and die within the twelvemonth i to toil life's long journey sad and lone praying daily hourly for that release which shall join us together again in that dear realm where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest now sir if you will be so kind as to look at these maps and plans in my portfolio i am sure i can sell you an echo for less money than any man in the trade now this one which cost my uncle ten dollars thirty years ago and is one of the sweetest things in texas i will let you have for let me interrupt you i said my friend i have not had a moment's respite from canvassers this day i have bought a sewing machine which i did not want i have bought a map which is mistaken in all its details i have bought a clock which will not go i have bought a moth poison which the moths prefer to any other beverage i have bought no end of useless inventions and now i have had enough of this foolishness i would not have one of your echoes if you were even to give it to me i would not let it stay on the place i always hate a man that tries to sell me echoes you see this gun now take your collection and move on let us not have bloodshed but he only smiled a sad sweet smile and got out some more diagrams you know the result perfectly well because you know that when you have once opened the door to a canvasser the trouble is done and you have got to suffer defeat i compromised with this man at the end of an intolerable hour i bought two double-barreled echoes in good condition and he threw in another which he said was not saleable because it only spoke german he said she was a perfect polyglot once but somehow her palate got down mark twain end of the canvasser's tale read by john greenman